good um good day my brethren greetings greetings wherever you are welcome again on uh herald report ministry um uh, i wanted to uh, uh, take a study uh let's study together uh, the subject of uh, the study is righteousness by faith righteousness by faith um, allow me to uh, begin by word of prayer uh, whenever we open the word of god um, we need to invite the presence of the holy spirit because it is him who inspired the writing, the writing of uh, the word. And it behooves us to seek his guidance um, and his inspiration whenever we study the word. So uh, please bow your heads with me and uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for another opportunity to study your word. Father, we ask that you may be with us as we open your word. May you also open our hearts. We pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Keep our minds fixed on your word. Help us not to wander. Draw our minds back that we will be absorbed with eternal things. Bless each and every person who is going to listen. And those who are going to watch um, this presentation. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we are looking at the uh, title Righteousness. Righteousness by faith. As I put it right there on the screen. Now the question is, what is righteousness by, by faith? Now, um, the reason why this study is so important, brethren, we're living at such a critical time of Earth's history. Great things are taking place. Um, we're told that there's great movements that are going on right now. And um, it behooves us to understand which position we need to assume, we need to take. And as I was looking at uh, the things that are going on in the world right now, the looming crisis, there's a crisis before us. Now, how do we prepare for the crisis which is right before us. How do we prepare for the crisis which is right before us? There's a great work to be done, but there's a little time in which this work must be done. Great work to be done, but there's a little time in which this work must be done. I don't have to remind you, brethren, that we're living in the very last days. Signs of the times are everywhere. We've seen the pandemics. We've seen the wars. They are currently going on. Iniquity abounds. We have seen all the signs that the Savior foretold would come to pass. The question then is, how do we prepare when we have such a little time? Because you see, when Christ comes, he's coming to take his. In another place, my favorite author, Sister White, says, Christ is longing with a longing desire for the manifestation of his character in his people. We are told that when his character is fully reproduced, then he shall come. 
But how do we get to a point when his character is fully reproduced in us? You see, I'm following uh, the thoughts that the Apostle Paul shares in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, towards the end of the chapter, the Apostle Paul shares the condition that many of us are in. We want to do the right thing, but we find no strength in ourselves to do the right thing. The will is present, but the flesh is weak. We might see the looming crisis. We see it's coming. But how do we get to a point where we can say for sure, like the Apostle Paul, afterwards, he says when he was writing to Timothy, but I've run the race. Now I'm waiting for the crown. How do we get to a point where we are confident? Like John the Beloved, who say, when he comes, we shall be as he is. The answer, brethren, is righteousness by faith. Now, I want you to understand this subject in connection with this text here in Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 3. In Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 3, servant of the Lord said, Seek, says he, Seek ye the Lord, O ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be he shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Now, brethren, uh, this is the Spirit of God inspiring the writing of this text. The only solution to stand in the day of the Lord's anger, or let me put it in other words, the only um, hope for anybody to stand in the crisis before us is righteousness. God says, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So it behooves us to study, brethren, and ask questions and be settled in our minds as to how we can attain this righteousness. Because I can see from the reading of this text when we attain this righteousness, then crisis may come. Whatever may come, we will not be moved. I want you to look at this text here um, in Luke. It's interesting because our Savior did discuss the issue of righteousness by faith in many places. This is one of the places where Jesus uh, discusses the issue of righteousness by faith. We're just looking at some texts now uh, as we study. I hope you will keep up with me. In Luke chapter 8 verse 9, Jesus here shares a parable. He says, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So understand the context of this parable. Jesus is speaking to a class of people who were trusting in themselves. They thought they were righteous. Now, one thing we don't want to do, brethren, is to reach the crisis, to enter upon the crisis, thinking that we're righteous when we're not. I would rather be told of God that I'm righteous. 
So Jesus is speaking to a class of people here. They thought the righteous. They trusted in themselves and despised others. In verse 10 he says, Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. So you got two people, two classes of people. One a Pharisee, another a public. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. Now, this is the Pharisee now praying. He stood up. Interesting that the Pharisee was not even kneeling. He stood and prayed thus with himself. So he's speaking about himself as he prays. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. He goes on to say, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, notice in verse 18 now, this is a publican. This is a publican prayer. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven but smote his breast saying God be merciful to me a sinner now verse 14 Jesus says I tell you this man speaking of the publican this was the last man who was mentioned I tell you this man went down to his house justified. Now underscore the word justified rather than the other for everyone that exalted himself shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now I said this study is entitled righteousness by faith. Remember when we started reading this story, Jesus was speaking to a class of people who thought they were righteous. So, as we study this story, we want to be cleared of this self-deception. I might think I'm righteous. It doesn't matter what I think of myself. What matters is what, God, is what God thinks of me. Now, we have two classes of people here mentioned. There's a Pharisee and there's a publican. The Pharisee has done many good things. I mean, there's a list of many good things. These things are commendable. But then you have a publican who is a sinner. In fact, publicans were known to be sinners. They were known for corruption. But now the difference is the publican knows that he is a sinner. The Pharisee thinks that he is righteous. So how is the subject of righteousness by faith linking with this case study? Jesus says at the end of this parable that the Pharisee prayed but the publican also prayed. And he says, the one who went justified or made righteous was a publican. Why? Because the publican came forward, confessed his sin. He was sincerely sorry of what he had done. God forgave him. And he was justified. So, I wanted us to look at the word justify. Now, if you look at the word justified, uh, look at the original word that was used. The Greek word justified there is dikaio. Dikaio. It means to render that is, show or regard as just or innocent. Now, you will notice that 
in the Bible, there is no difference between somebody who is righteous and somebody who is justified. So the moment you are forgiven, the moment your sins are cleansed, the moment God forgives you, you are righteous before God. You are righteous before God. You are justified. God says you are just. In fact, Romans 8 verse 1 says there is therefore now no condemnation. Now, the opposite of condemnation is justification. If somebody is justified, it means they are not condemned. They are commended. But notice, Romans 8 verse 1 says there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We are going to go back to that text. But this is the root word here. To render, show or regard as just or innocent or free. Another word which has been used there. So in, in fact, the, the, the root word dekayo also means righteous. So, so these words are used interchangeably. So if you have righteous, so, so in a way what I've noticed in my study is that the, 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 the root word is dekayo. The Greek word is dekayo. Now, if you now see where it says righteous, the, the word there, the Greek word is dekaios. Just like saying good and goodness. So it's the same word. They're used interchangeably. So when somebody is just or justified, they are um, they're righteous. Now, let's also look at uh, this other text here for a moment. Um, 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 let's 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 study let's study and look at this text together and uh, and see where we're going with this. Now, in Romans chapter one, verse sixteen, remember our subject st uh, 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 study uh, subject of the study is righteousness by faith. How do we get to this point? when we are declared righteous by God. Because if I am righteous, if I am justified, I have no need to worry about the events, events that are coming upon the world. I, I stress this point. I, I'm just focusing on the solution. I hear a lot people talk about the crisis. People talk about the problems. But not many times do we hear about the solution, how to brace ourselves for the problems, the crisis that is before us. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So notice, Paul says he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now notice in verse 17, for therein, in this gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Again, we see the two words are used here, righteousness and just. But notice, Paul is saying, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith. Now, I want to pause right there. Now, the best way to reveal the gospel is, again, to go back to the sanctuary service. You see, the sanctuary service is gospel, is the gospel in pictures. What you see in the sanctuary service is the gospel in pictures. God is revealing how he intends to save man. You need a lamb. 
that is unspot, without spot or without blemish. That lamb, you confess your sin, put your hand over his head, confess your sin. And as you confess your sin, as you repent of your sin and confess your sin, the sin by faith is transferred from the sinner to the lamb. The lamb was then killed. It was the sinner who took the knife and killed the lamb or the animal, whatever that God had instructed. Now, notice what's going on here. The, the, the text is saying, in this gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. So, maybe let's think about this. Righteousness, I've, I've heard some people say righteousness is right doing. It's a plausible um, definition, but I think it falls short. Now, if you say righteousness is right doing, next question is, according to who? Whose eyes? Is it right doing in my eyes or right doing in God's eyes? Because the case study we looked before, there was a Pharisee who was doing the right thing, but in his eyes. So he thought he was righteous, but God didn't think he was righteous. So it's important now that when we define righteousness, we have to say right doing in God's eyes. Because I might do the right thing that people might think I'm doing the right thing. I'm ticking all the boxes. But in God's eyes, I'm a sinner. Because I'm doing it for people. Now, in the gospel, herein, verse 17 says, For therein in the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So you'll notice that it took faith. For the sinner to bring the lamb. The sinner had to believe that the lamb was going to be um, uh, 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 the, the victim. Or should I say, it took faith for the sinner to believe once they had sinned that it was sufficient for them to bring the lamb. Or whatever animal they were supposed to bring. It took faith to leave that outer court. Knowing that they had been forgiven. Because you see, forgiveness is not physical. It's not tangible. You have to believe. After such an act that I have been forgiven. You have to believe that this lamb now bears my sin. And on the Day of Atonement, you have to believe that my sin has been carried out of the sanctuary. My sin has been blotted out. So from faith, you start with faith. In fact, another Bible version says, you start with faith and you finish with faith. If you look, some other lighter version says, you start with faith and you finish with faith. Now the subject study is righteousness by faith. How do we get to this point where we know in the eyes of God we are righteous? Because it's not good enough to be righteous in our own eyes. So what are we taking away from Romans 16, uh, 1 verse 16 and 17? In the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, that is where God reveals his righteousness. In other words, if we're going to link this with uh, um, the text that we shared earlier uh, from Luke, the two um, people went to pray. There was the publican and the Pharisee. What Paul is simply saying is, you become righteous once you're forgiven. See, you have to believe that the Lamb 
is without spot, without blemish, can bear my sin. You have to believe uh, John 1 verse 29. See, John 1 verse 29 says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You have to believe that. Righteousness starts here. This is where it starts. That Christ died for me. Christ died in my place. And when he died, my sin killed Christ. My sin was paid for. That is when righteousness begins. From faith, you start with faith. And you finish with faith. It's a process. It starts here. This is the starting point. But once you have believed. And you have been forgiven. That means. In the eyes of God. You're righteous. Now. Follow carefully with me. You see. During the time of Sister White. And uh, some of our pioneers. When the subject of righteousness of by, uh, righteousness by faith uh, 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 gained attention, um, I think the, uh, the, uh, the 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 climax when this uh, subject uh, gained much attention was in year 1888. Uh, those who understand the history of the Adventist Church. Uh, you understand that there was two men who were given this message. Uh, Sister White herself says that God gave these two elders a message that God's people desperately needed. The message of righteousness by faith. So a lot of people were writing to Sister White because you see, connected to the third angel's message is the message of righteousness by faith. And Revelation 14, verse 12, we are told, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is the patience of the saints. So, where is here? So, you have a situation, a crisis that is going on. You have a crisis. You have a people who are receiving the mark of the beast. And you have a people who have the seal of the living God. But before people can decide which side to be on, uh, on which side to be on, the first message has been preached, the first angel's message. The second angel's message has been preached. Now there's a warning in the third angel's message. In this crisis now, is this Christ, because you see, those who refuse to receive the mark in their hand or on their forehead, or in their forehead rather, they will be persecuted. See, there's two rights that we have to come face to face. It's either you refuse the mark in your hand or in your forehead. You will receive the wrath of men, the wrath of the dragon. We are told that he went forward in Revelation 12, verse 17. The dragon, this is Satan's name when he comes to persecution. He's called the dragon. He comes to persecute. So here at this time, this declaration in Revelation 14 verse 12 is happening at this time, at this crisis hour. Here is the patience of the saints. So this class of people who have the faith of Jesus, uh, 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 who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, are the people. This is the class of the people who are going to be able to stand. So the question is, how do you get there? Now, Sister White here says, because a lot of people were asking Sister White, is the message righteousness and uh, righteousness by faith, um, um, is it the third angel's message? 
This is this was their response. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. She says it is the third angel's message in verity. Now what makes this message very important? As I said before, this is the solution. When we come to the crisis hour. But again, we still need to learn what exactly this uh, message is all about. Because God would have his people to understand how he makes us righteous. How we can be fit to stand in the crisis hour. I mean, God is so kind, so merciful. He will not leave us without information as to how we're going to be able to stand in this crisis hour. Now, we're going to make use of Matthew chapter 8 from verse 7. We say it, righteousness by faith. To become righteous, you get there by faith. Righteousness, we say it is the state of being where you are right in the eyes of God. So when we say righteousness by faith, we're simply saying you get to a state, that kind of state, by faith. You don't have to look to what you've done. You don't have to look to yourself. I don't have to look to myself. But I have to look to Christ. Because you see, I have no righteousness of myself. I have no righteousness of my own self. The only righteousness that matters in the crisis is the righteousness of Christ. And we attain his righteousness by faith. But let's understand now, what is faith? We, we, we know this is where we want to get to. We want to be righteous as Christ is righteous. But what is this faith? How do we obtain this faith? What is this faith? Now, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 7, here is the story of the centurion. Like I said before, Jesus taught in many places this subject of righteousness by faith. If you notice, he was teaching all over the place. You find Jesus speaking of faith. Ye of little faith. A, a, a lot of mention on the issue of faith. Now, in Matthew chapter 8, you find the story of the centurion. Jesus, this was just another day in the life of Jesus, doing his works of healing. There were great throngs that were following him. And in verse 7 he says, And Jesus, now a centurion came to him. Let me just give you a background. So a centurion comes to Jesus. And he says to Jesus, Master, my servant is lying home. He is sick. Of power. And he shares his desire with Jesus, how he wanted his servant to be healed. Now, in verse 7, he says, And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Verse 7. Verse 8 now. Pay attention now to what the centurion has to say. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. I am not worthy. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. He goes on to say in verse 9, For I am a man, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come. And he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. Now notice in verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily, 
I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. I repeat what Jesus says. Verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Now, the question then is, what is Jesus referring to as faith in this case study? Because you see, I mean, Jesus has to define what faith is because he is the author and finisher of our faith, according to Hebrews. He is the author and finisher of our faith. So he is the one who has the right to define what faith is. So now he defines what faith is. But understand what Jesus refers to as faith. Notice the centurion came. He says, my servant is sick. He needs healing. Jesus now says in verse 7, I will come and heal him. But the centurion checks him out. He says, Savior. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But, now underscore, where it says, but, speak the word only. Brethren, what is faith? You know, many a times when we study um, faith, we quickly run to Hebrews chapter 11. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 defines faith. But many of God's people, many of God's people, we don't fully understand what Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 talks about. Yes, it contains the definition. But now... Let's get the definition from Jesus himself. Jesus says, the centurion says rather, because this is what Jesus refers to as faith. The centurion says, speak the word only. So, faith then is expecting God's word to do exactly what it says it will. Now, I repeat this. This is the centurion's understanding of faith. The centurion says, speak the word only. So what is faith? Faith is expecting God's word to do exactly what it says it will do. This is what now Jesus says. Verily, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. Now notice, when the centurion finished saying that, he then goes on to say, I am a man under authority. So basically he's saying, Jesus, you are a man under authority. Your authority is greater than mine. So the centurion understands that the man who is before him is not an ordinary man. He says, he understands that this man before him can speak and things happen. I believe the centurion had read Genesis chapter 1, maybe verse 3, where he says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. See, God spoke, and it happened. God's word has a creative power in it. See, you and I can speak, but unless we do something after we speak, we shall be called liars. We have to follow up our words. You know, when people say, this man is a man of his word, what they mean is, when this man speaks, he follows up what he says. But God doesn't need to follow up. God speaks and things happen. In God's word, there is creative power. When God said, let there be light, there was light. This is what the centurion understands. In a way, the centurion is saying, Master, you have so much authority. You only have to speak. 
and things will happen. Now, my brethren, why is it so important to understand what faith is? Faith is expecting God's word to do what it says it will. We say the subject study is righteousness by faith. How do we become righteous? We expect God's word to do what it says it will by faith. So Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No. Not in Israel. If you notice many times when God was speaking to his disciples, he would say, Ye of little faith. Ye of little faith. But here Jesus says, This faith of the centurion was great. So what is faith? Faith is expecting God's word to do exactly what it says it will. Now, let me read uh, this quotation here. This quotation comes from um, uh, the book Christ Object Lessons. Um, uh, uh, there's another follow-up quotation where you'll find the reference. So, here Sister White, again, my favorite author, she is quoting John 6, verse 63. And John 5, verse 24. Now, understand this now. In the context of faith. She says, The word of God is the seed. Every seed has in itself a germinating principle. In it, the life of the plant is enfolded. So, when you have a seed, God has put inside the seed a germinating principle. So, you pick a corn seed or maize seed. There's a germinating principle in that seed. The life of maize is in that seed. So, so, so understand this allegory. I, I mean, this this, this analogy. In the life of the plant, uh, sorry, in, in, in the seed, it says, in it, in the seed, the life of the plant is enfolded. So, there is life in God's word. Because you see, God's word is a seed. See, in this chapter, Sister White was commenting on the parable of the sower. In the Bible, the same uh, 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 scripture, Jesus then goes on to explain that that seed that the sower went forth to sow was the word of God. Jesus was that man, the sower, who came to this world under difficult circumstances to sow the word of God. So there is life, she goes on to say, so there is life in God's word. See, brethren, this is God's word. There is life in God's word. Christ says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And they are life. That's from John 6, verse 63. He that heareth my word, Jesus says, and believeth on him that sent me, have everlasting life. So in a way, faith is expecting God's word to do exactly what it says it will. See, we serve a God with so much authority. If God says, fear not, the power to protect you is enfolded in that fear not because it is God who has said it. 
I mean, if I say to you, fear not, you have every reason to question me because I have no authority to tell anybody not to fear. But if God says, fear not, for I am with you, you better believe and take it by faith. Why? Because God who says, fear not, is the God who speaks. He doesn't have to follow up. His word guarantees that thing that he says. So faith is expecting God's word to do what it says it will do. Notice this other quotation here. So this is a follow-up from the previous quotation from, again, Christ Object Lessons. Page 38, paragraph 1. It says, in every command, think of any command that God has ever given in his word. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power. So the power is enfolded in that command. God's biddings are his enablings. When God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, the power to not commit adultery is enfolded in that command. If you believe God has said, I should not, he will give you the power. He finishes you with the power to not commit adultery. So in every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power. So pick any promise, pick any command, there is the power. The very life of God by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. He who by faith receives the word is receiving the very life and character of God. This is powerful, brother. He who by faith receives this word is receiving the very life and character of God. This is powerful, brother. This is powerful. How often do you trust in the word of God? How often do you take God at his word? So now, when you go back now to Hebrews chapter 11, and study the lives of those holy men. Now understand the context of Hebrew chapter 11 in this. This is the context. These were men who lived by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. It's interesting that in Revelation chapter 14, uh, notice Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. We referred to this text earlier. It says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's interesting that this, what is referred to as the faith of Jesus. This is not the faith in Jesus. This is the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is living by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. This is exactly what Jesus demonstrated when he was tried, when he was tempted. Uh, when you study Matthew chapter 4 or Luke chapter 4, you notice that at every temptation, what did Jesus say? It is written. Faith is believing, trusting that God's word will do exactly what it says it will do. This is the faith of Jesus. What's going to help us to stand in the crisis hour is taking God at his word. We are made righteous when we start to take God at his word. I have to say this differently. Righteousness by faith is taking God at his word. God said it, it is so, because God said it. 
And not because I feel it or because I see it, but because God said it. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4, this is Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But he answered, he's answering the devil. Jesus says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. See, when Jesus came to this world, the reason why it's called the faith of Jesus this was the chief object of his mission. To lift up, to uplift the word of God. The word of God is his kind. See, what God calls faith, what God is looking for in you and in me before the crisis hour, we need to start to take God at his word. This is what is called faith. Living by faith is living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Faith is not a feeling. It is a principle. God said it. I ran with it. Brethren, if we have not made it our custom, if we have not made it a habit of taking God at his word, we will be found wanting in the crisis hour. If we have not made it our custom to trust in God, we will be found wanting, I repeat, in the crisis hour. So when you read the heroes of faith, now read that in the context of taking God at his word. That man, Abel, the first martyr, by faith, he offered a more respectable sacrifice. Why? Because he took God at his word. That God means what he said. But what did Cain do? Cain thought that God will change. Cain had a religion of convenience. He worships God according to the dictates, to the dictate of his mind or of his feelings, or according to the dictate of his mood, he feels like, oh, I can't be bothered today. He wants to reinvent the worship of God. Righteousness by faith, brethren, is living by faith. Living by faith is living by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Brethren, I want you to go back to the screen. Now, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, it's a powerful text. Luke chapter 18, verse 6. And uh, verse 6 to verse 8. So this is after Jesus had shared uh, that parable. Um, but notice now how he ends this parable. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge say. And shall not God avenge his own elect? which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Notice in verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. 
nevertheless, underscore this last powerful st statement. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? This is a question that Jesus is asking. When the Son of Man cometh, when Jesus shall come, shall he find faith on the earth? Again, what is faith? Faith is living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So in a way, Jesus is asking, when he comes back again the second time, is there going to be a people who will still declare, as Jesus declared, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Brethren, now is the time. Now is the time to familiarize ourselves with the Word of God. See, the Word of God, as it is, is living. We call this the living Bible or the living Word of God because it is living, it is not dead. So living by every word means that we trust whatever God says, it will come to pass. Because God is not a man that he should lie. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Christ is always before us, brethren. Now is the time Let us ask God to give us strength. Many of us, like the doubting Thomases, like some of the disciples, we have not made it our custom to trust God's word. But what is going to take us through the crisis hour is the word of God. Taking God at his word. So what is righteousness by faith? We are declared righteous by faith. What is faith? Faith is expecting God to do exactly what he says he, to, he will in his word. Faith is expecting the word of God to do exactly what he says it will do. Hence why? It's called the faith of Jesus. See, Jesus' life, he was governed by the word of God, not by tradition, not by the sayings of the fathers, not by the sayings of the Pharisees or the, the church leaders. Jesus' motto was, it is written. How readest thou? That's why it's called the faith of Jesus. Those who are going to stand in the crisis hour should adapt this principle of saying it is written, where is it written? We should be asking, where is it written? Show me what say the scriptures. Otherwise, we will be uh, overtaken by the enemy. We're also told in the closing scenes of Earth's history, Satan is going to uh, come so much cunning with so much craftiness how are we going to detect the snares and the movements of the enemy is by the word god bless us brethren now is the time ask god through his holy spirit to put in us such trust such belief in the word of God. My prayer is like one of that man who said to Christ, I believe.
but help my unbelief. There's many of us, brethren, who invent a number of ways. We always have uh, 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 reference points when we come to problems, but not the Word of God. How many of us are practicing now when we're put in trying situations, when we're put in tests at work or in our studies, how many are now starting to practice the principle that Jesus lived by? It is written. How many are making it their priority to refer to what is written? I implore you, brethren, to make the word of God the standard and the foundation of our belief. I like what Zwingli said once. He said, when it comes to matters of faith, the Bible is our constitution. May God bless you, brethren. God grant you that righteousness that comes only through faith. Faith cometh by hearing and by hearing the word of God. It is expecting that word to do what it says it will do. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our loving Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. How shall we be made righteous? We are made righteous by faith. Faith is expecting your word to do what it says it will do. Oh Lord, many of us, we ponder on opinions of men. Uh, we are so meddled with the opinions of men. Lord, we ask that you may help us to untangle ourselves from the opinions of men and what saved men that we may be rooted in your word, that we may say with Christ, it is written on every step of the way, even when it comes to the crisis out, that we will not be moved because we'll be rooted on it is written. Thank you for the studying of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.